ultimately we're driven so much by chemical reactions. And the reality is when I buy a stock and it goes up 10%, I get a little hit. It's like I just did a shot. It's just like it's like I just saw something sexy. It's like I just took a toke of a cigarette or or, or or you know, man, did did a little bit of a drug. You know, that's that's awesome. And then I, and I want to do it again and I want to do it again and again. And that's what gets in the way of the plan. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. And today we're going to be taking a little more of a rock and roll look at the share market from the point of view of my guest, Enrique Abeta. Hello, Enrique. Hey, Phil. Enrique is a financial newsletter writer and owner, the co-founder of Project M that owns digital magazines like the number one brand in tattooing, Inked Magazine, as well as the number one brand in rock metal music, Revolver Magazine. He's also founded and run hedge funds on Wall Street for 20 plus years. So, Enrique, tell us about Project M and what must be a change of pace for you. Yeah, you know, look, I uh, I started the company four years ago, and uh, as you mentioned, we own the number one media brands globally, premium media brands in rock and metal, revolver, and in tattooing, ink is in the tattoo. And, uh, you know, what's interesting about it is it was something I've always done a lot of technology, media, and telecom investing, what they call TMT. I've always been doing a lot of private investing, and I saw an opportunity four years ago to get involved in uh, direct-to-consumer e-commerce, uh, which I think is a hundred-foot wave moving its way through the economy, the same way hedge funds were when I got involved in them back in 1996 or 25 years ago. And so um, this was an opportunity to do that in areas that I was passionate about. And it's been a hell of a ride. It's not been easy at all and not, not so fun sometimes, but the company's doing great now. So in another interview, I saw you uh, speaking about how actually running a company now is making you a better investor. How does that work? Well, you know, it's interesting. I started my first hedge fund when I was 28 years old, uh, my partners and I. And at the time, I think our mentality was, oh, we're going to start a hedge fund. That means we control all the investments. What we didn't think about was it also meant we have to make decisions about real estate and technology and HR and, and all of that. So I think that I benefited from the fact that I started two hedge funds as managing partner and had to make those decisions. And in general, I'm going to say something about fund managers. Um, they're terrible business people. Uh, you know, it's, I've always been amazed that you'll have a fund manager get up there and go to a CEO of a company, someone who's been operating companies for decades and basically castigate them and be like, you should be doing this, that, or the other. And then when you go internally at these funds, their businesses are freaking disasters. I think there's a real hubris and lack of humility. And so getting to Project M, I think I benefited from having run my own funds and that made me a better investor. This is just the whole nother level. You know, when you have to build, I mean, we built this company while we did some acquisitions, we basically have taken it from zero to $10 million of revenue. We're growing 130% year over year. It's just a ton of work. And when you're in the real world, Wall Street and finance, you're making a lot of decisions on paper that move a lot of money. In the real world, you're making a lot of decisions in the real world that move a lot of people and assets. And it's just a different, different type of uh, focus. And I guess what I would really say is this. I think I have a much better understanding for the complexities of companies and how they operate from actually having operated one. And it helps me identify um, situations better than just being some guy behind a computer screen sitting on you know some office in, in midtown Manhattan. It's interesting. I was uh, just editing another interview with another guest earlier today, and he was saying that he was a management consultant and he could see how much difference the culture of management made to the running of a company, how well it was running. And that's not, that's something that doesn't show in the numbers, is it? It's, it's something that is uh, needs to be nurtured and engendered by management. Well, well I'm going to tell you something. I'm actually writing my newsletter for this week tonight. Uh, it's a late night. My, my wife had a child last Friday, so it's been a hectic That's right. Hectic, Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. You know, my topic in the, in the, in the, in the newsletter this week is actually going to be about quality of management because it's something that really irks me. You know, you talk to a lot of uh, a lot of money managers, and you go, "What's what's one of the, the most important thing or one of the most important things in investing?" They go, "Oh, quality of management." But then I'm like, "Okay, you 
Mr. Wall Street guy, you went to Ivy League school, did two years in banking, got an MBA, did another two years, and you've sat behind a computer screen for 15 years. What the hell do you know about running a company, much less an e-commerce company or a pharmaceutical company or any of it? And I think it's very difficult from the outside for us to make judgments. You know, some of the best managers in the world turned out to be not so hot. You know, look at GE, Jack Welch and Tycho, Dennis Kozlowski was, was hailed. So what I've found instead, I, I'm actually going to disagree with you. What I found is the best thing in terms of indication of management actually is past performance and it is the numbers. I think that you have to take a look and I look at it and say, if I can find a company that has grown and outperformed expectations consistently across multiple years. Yes, that may be a result of a big wave behind them, something macro, but if you do it across three to five years, that means management has this shit locked down. And if you combine that with a sound financial sense, because by the way, the, the financials of both GE and Tyco were painfully obvious, because I'm, I'm a very well-known short seller as well, it was painfully obvious what the problems are there. That's really your best bet, because I think it's just hubris when I hear money managers go, oh, I only buy good managements. I'm like, how the hell would you know, bro? Like, you, you've never managed anything. You never worked at a friggin' McDonald's. So, you know, <laughs> it, it's, it's, I think it's just a lot of hubris. And, and to me, it's, it's about the results and then, and then putting that in the right framework. Well, the name of this podcast is Stocks for Beginners, which gives me license to ask stupid questions. And this is going to be a stupid question now. What is a hedge fund? Very simply, think of a hedge fund in two ways. You can only invest in a hedge fund if you have a certain amount of net worth. The idea being, which is not at all necessarily true, that wealthier people have a level of sophistication. And therefore, the hedge funds have a different regulatory set that, this is the second piece, allows them much greater flexibility. The single most important thing is that hedge funds, in addition to being able to go long stocks, benefit from a stock going up, can almost always go short stocks, benefit from stocks going down. But if you really bring it back to what a hedge fund is, it is a regulatory type of fund structure for wealthy people that allows greater flexibility. That flexibility can take any number of, of, uh, of facets, the most common being short selling, but it could be asset class, private investments, you name it. So this is, again, this is where beginners we're talking about. So a beginner is not necessarily going to be able to get the benefits of the flexibility of a hedge fund, but they can get benefits of management within, say, ETFs these days. Is that the best place for beginners to start? I think it really depends. Um, you know, there's been such a proliferation of vehicles for investors that I think there's a lot more opportunity now. But, you know, look, I, what's the best thing a beginner can do? Read five or 10 books that I would recommend, study a lot, come up with a great plan, subscribe to my newsletter. Uh, and I'm really not kidding with that because I'll tell you why. Because I think there's just some very simple rules that investors need to follow. And I'm going to start with one that, that's not so much a rule, but it, it's a way to think about it, so, you know, which is what's your goal in investing? A goal most people would say is, well, I'm investing to make money. Well, that means a lot of different things. If you are investing with a 30-year time frame and you want to take your retirement savings and grow it immensely, that's a much different kind of thing than I've got money that I need to buy a house in two years. I want to grow that money a little. The other thing is the reality is that people don't just invest themselves for money making. If they did, they would make much more rational decisions. People enjoy investing. So I think the most important thing is whatever you're investing, come up with the framework of what it is you're trying to accomplish and then create a plan around that framework that fits that framework. And one of my favorite sayings on Wall Street is plan the trade and trade the plan. You know, it doesn't have to be a trade. It could just be plan your strategy and, and, and you know, execute your strategy. Uh, but it works better when you say, you know, plan the trade and trade the plan. So, yeah. So, presumably, you've got, a, you've got different goals. I mean, if you might be just wanting to 
get a deposit for a house, for example, that's a completely different plan, a completely different time frame than if you, like you say, you're planning for your retirement. No, exactly right. You know, and, and like another thing that I say to people, and I'll bring in another concept here, either trade a lot or don't trade at all. You know, the biggest the biggest challenge in investing, in my opinion, single biggest challenge is the following, is people go out, they come up with a plan. Most of those plans are sound. I think there's some core beliefs in investing that I fundamentally don't believe with, but, but I will say 80% of the stuff that people say to do is sound. They go out and execute that plan, but then something happens and they go against the plan. You know, Mike Tyson said, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. And, and that's really it. And so where I see it with investors is you either need to embrace high turnover or embrace no turnover. If you are a high turnover trader that has a plan and are trading actively, like you're playing blackjack, you know, playing hand after hand after hand, if you play a lot of hands of blackjack, then you're going to, you know, you're going to work, it's going to work out if you're disciplined. Or you need to take a 10 year view and go out for that view and then ignore it and don't do anything. And again, I think the problem is everyone goes into it saying I'm a long term investor until the first time they get punched in the face and now they're a trader. I guarantee you that won't work. And, and by the way, it's not individual investors. The vast, vast majority of active managers underperform the indices. It is, it is crazy to me how many of them underperform. And it's for this very reason is they say, oh, we're long term investors. Oh, but now we're risk managing, you know, <laughs> which in this case is taking all taking my plan and throwing it away because the market traded against me for a month, you know, something like that. Um, we're humans at the, at the end of the day. Yeah. Not all of us have got a customata looking after us as well. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with training. You know, well, I, it is. I, it's, I, the, I, it's the training, isn't it? And getting the right advice. And really, I'd, I'd like to yeah. come back to this point here, though, that you're saying people should be tra trading a lot or not at all. But some people go in and start trading a lot. I mean, a lot of people this year have come on to Robin Hood and I think it's a good time to be in there doing that, but they're going to get punched in the face as well. Oh, I, and by the way, I wasn't saying in general, I would say the vast majority of people should just not trade at all. <laughs> let me <laughs> let me be clear. I wasn't recommending one over the other. I was just saying, if you're going to do this, you must choose one of those. Um, you know, look, I think that trading, uh, you know, I always use this example. I use the example of dentistry. I, I'll meet someone and I'm like, you're a smart guy. You've done a lot of great things. You know, you've got a good education, whatever. You know, it doesn't matter. Um, we probably, you and I both could go read books about dentistry and figure it out. I don't think it's, it's not rocket science, literally. We could figure it out and we probably could figure out how to do dentistry on our family and friends. Yet we don't do that, <laughs> right? What we do is we rely on people who have decades of experience, yet when it comes to investing, this is crazy to me. You'll have professionals that have spent 20 years. I, I've seen this over and over. You'll have someone who, doctors, doctors will go. And if you went to a, a successful doctor who's got a big practice, made lots of money, and you say, Dr. Johnson, I want to form a medical practice. I want to partner with you. He will grill you to 20 ways to Sunday. He'll be like, what's your, what's your compensation structure? How are you doing your insurance? Follow up. You call Dr. Johnson up and say, hey, I got this stock. It's Chinese internet. If every person in China bought one of these, the thing's a, you know, a billion dollar company. It goes, how many shares, right? You know, it, it's because there, it, it lacks the friction. Uh, you know, you can just make the transaction, but, but that's psychology, right? You know, and, and that's what you have to break. And so it's like anything in life and it's your money, man. Like, take it seriously. But people don't because when I can go in and, and I, I'm going to go on a little, little tirade about something else, which is about dopamine and, you know, human psychology. Ultimately, we're driven so much by chemical reactions. And the reality is when I buy a stock and it goes up 10%, I get a little hit. It's like I just did a shot. It's just like it's like I just saw something sexy. It's like I just took a toke of a cigarette or, 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 or you know, man, did, did a little bit of a drug. You know, that's that's awesome. And then then I want to do it again and I want to do it again and again. And that's what gets in the way of the plan. 
is, you know, it, it can be very sexy. It's a drug addiction, man. Like, and, which, by the way, it's fine. You know, children are a drug addiction. They, they produce tremendous dopamine hits, you know, your entire lives and a lot of, you know, anger occasionally. But you just have to learn how to manage that and respect your own psychology and biology when investing, which is another big theme in my letter. And um, having a process, that's something to help you deal with the psychology that's involved because you've really got to push those uh, those thoughts aside. Um, one of the guests I've got coming up on the podcast is a sports psychologist and his mantra is lather, rinse, repeat. And you see that with great sports people as they get on the field and in the, into their field of endeavor, they just do the same thing over and over again. They're not thinking about anything else except the process. Well, I think it's those two. If I were to boil it down, it is, it is those two is have a plan, a well thought out plan and then control your psychology, which by the way, is why I'm saying not trading at all is a much easier way to control your psychology than trading a lot. Because not trading at all, taking some great positions, throwing them in a box and losing the password to your uh, account is a lot easier to do than making 20 decisions or, or, or more importantly, it's not about making 10 decisions a day, it's about making 100 decisions that you don't make. Right. That's that's actually what it is. I tell I, I was on Twitter today. The markets had a nice little run here. I say to people, the thing, the number one thing that people mess up in risk management most often is sell high. Sell high is hard. Buy low is easier than sell high. But you know what's really hard when you didn't sell high and then you try to buy low. That's impossible. Right. That's where you get sell low. Right. So, you know, it, it, it is those two things. Control your psychology and have a plan. But that's also, like I said, I'm just going to repeat it. That's why I think don't trade at all is by far the, the best plan for the vast, vast majority of investors. And because if you're not willing to do the work, guess what? You're not going to get the return. Period. End of story. And uh, these investors that even though they might be in the long term, they go through a period like earlier this year or the GFC, and they do end up selling and not hanging on for that long term. I Exactly. And, and that's where, where, where it really matters. Everyone's a, a brilliant in a bull market. You know, I've made debt money in every down market. Um, it's funny, as I, I just launched a newsletter, oh, a couple of weeks ago regarding SPACs, you know, special uh, purpose acquisition companies. But when I, I became a portfolio manager in 98, right before long term capital happened. I founded my first fund in 2001, six months before September 11th. I founded my second fund in 2008, three weeks before Lehman. The SPAC product, actually, my, my Empire Elite Growth launched a month before COVID, and the SPAC product launched right before the market got hit COVID again. Yeah, again, so I think it's, it's these things. It's little simple rules, you know. It's selling high. It's understanding you know, what are you going to do when the panic happens, you know, but I, I'll come back to you if I had to pound one thing in people's head, think long term, think big growth and don't trade at all that you really if your goal is making money. Actually, if your goal is making money and living a good life, this is what you do. I'm going to make it so easy. OK, find companies that are earning a dollar today that you think have a very, very good shot of earning $10 sometime in the future. And a and dollar doesn't matter. X, you know, find companies where you say the chances that they earn 10X are so great. So I'm going to give you one example. Match.com. It's the online dating service. Um, they have 13 million paying customers. They're by far the market leader. There are 3 billion people on the face of this planet that are on the internet that are not in a relationship. OK, matter of fact, there's probably a half a billion that are in a relationship, but it doesn't matter. So that means the TAM of people that either want to get laid or be in a relationship on the face of planet Earth is three billion people. They have 13 million customers. So I don't know if they end up having a billion customers or 100 million or 50 million. All I know is in the next 10 years, it's going to be a lot more than 13 million. It's a guarantee. It's a guarantee. Take that damn stock, throw it in a box. And leave, just just go away. And and so that to me, find things that are earning X, figure out that ones that can earn 10X, throw it in a box and leave. And then just throw more money into it every week, every month. And you know, that if, if your goal is make money, least amount of stress. Now the reality is people have a lot of other goals, <laughs> whether they acknowledge them or not. Uh, but that would be my my very strong advice. So part of this advice as well is being optimistic, isn't it? You have, um, you've spoken about optimism and you've written about optimism and optimism is what drives 
the stock market in the long run? Well, you know, look, I, I'll say a couple things. It always sounds smart to be critical. Right. You know, the human brain reacts to negative uh, stimulus eight times more actively chemically than it does positive stimulus. Here's the reason why, you know, think back to caveman times. Me having a, a great meal is is impactful. Me falling off a cliff and dying ends my genetic line. So we are genetically predisposed to overvalue negative information. So that means, you know, the, the, the person that sounds smartest at the dinner party is not the person that says, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. And here's three more ways it'll work. It's the guy at the end who goes, yeah, I guess that one could work. But what about A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K? You know, that's the smart guy. But, but he's not. He's the dumb guy. He's the guy who really doesn't understand it because no one ever made a killing on a stock they didn't buy. Right. I get risk management. I get value investing, although value investing is a death cult. It is literally one of the most detrimental things to individual investors that's ever been invented. I mean, it is it's like cigarettes. It's like tobacco. OK, we'll go back to that in a second. But you can't make money if you're not invested. You can get yourself out of every investment. And then, you know, what happens is people just end up like either being too risk averse or, 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 or buying mediocre investments. Why don't you? appropriately diversify, come up with a good long-term strategy. And then here's the thing, find companies, because we can find the man that are earning X and that will earn 10, 20, 50, 100 X. They're out there. Find those, end of story. That, that, so that's not, I don't know if that's optimism. I call that friggin' logic. Uh, common sense is what I would call it. Yeah, so. a friend of myself, we call it toxic positivity. We, we try and impart toxic positivity on the world. <laughs> No, it's it's important. It's important. And it I'll is. Say one of the, it is. I, it's important to be optimistic, isn't it? So important. I had in the newsletter that maybe it was the one you read. I had, um, you know, I, I wrote this thing when I started in my career. I worked for a guy named Martin Sosnoff, uh, who'd been around for decades. Um, you know, he's still alive. He must be in his 80s. And I, I wish he would have said this more clearly to me. But we'd sit there and I'd go through. I was 26 years old and all hot to trot. Came out of Wharton. And I'd be like, oh, check this out. Check out this. Blah, blah. And he'd sit there and he would smoke his cigar. I'd go in right after the market opened. He had a giant Churchill cigar because back then you could do that. And he'd sit there and he'd toke on his cigar. And then he'd just say to me, he'd, wait, he'd let me kind of spill my guts, all this thing. And he goes, you know, that all sounds real smart to me. But, you know, ultimately, if we find good companies that are going to grow a lot, they probably go up. And they go, OK, get out of here. Like, and, you know, I, and what I wish he would have done, I wrote this in the letter. I wish he would have grabbed me by, by my damn collar and smacked me across the face 10 times and said, shut the F up with all this noise, find great companies, buy them, bring me great companies that are going to, that are going to grow earnings 10 times. Cause I'll tell you, I'd be doing this call from my Mars base with Elon Musk right now. Cause I'd be that much richer, you know, if, uh, if I would have, if you just would have slapped me around a little and said it differently. So. so value investing as a death cult, that's an interesting uh, perspective <laughs> on it. <laughs> there must be a tattoo in that. <laughs> yeah. No, look, here's, here's the point is I think that value investing is, okay, I wasn't kidding, man. It's, it's like cigarettes, negative information. Value investing is based on, you know, playing to your fears and, 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 you know, all that. And so I think that it feels very comfortable intellectually. But I'm going to tell you something that I, is 100% correct. No value stock ever went up ever because it was cheap. It only went up because it grew. Okay. So if you give me something that's trading at 0.2 times book, I'm going to tell you something. If book shrinks and or earnings shrink, it will trade at less than 0.2 times book. I guarantee it. However, if it's trading at 0.2 times book and all of a sudden it stabilizes and starts to grow. Well, now it's going to trade a book. That's everything. I mean, you know, they talk about Warren Buffett and he's the greatest value investor. Coca-Cola, man, really? Like Apple, like those were his value stocks. I think Apple went up because they went from earning $100 million to earning $100 billion. That's what I call growth. That's not value and everything he ever did. So, you know, value isn't even a style. Value just a, is just a characteristic. Growth is what makes companies go up. So yes, if you can find cheap stocks that are going to grow and especially hit an inflection point to growth, they're great. 
but you're finding cheap growth stocks. You're not finding value stocks and everything else. Give me a company that's trading at a discount to bulk. I'll tell you this. Some of my best shorts are these super high yielding companies, something trading at 14% dividend yield. Because what the market's telling you, they're about to cut the dividend. When they cut that dividend, whoa, Nelly, there's 30, 40, 50% of the people who own that stock who don't get it and they're going to run for the hills. So yeah, I think it, it, it's like tobacco, man. It's like you take that little hit, it feels so good, but ultimately it's going to kill you. You mentioned before that uh, five or 10 books that you'd recommend reading. Do you have them off the top of your head? Yeah, you know, a couple, um, How to Make Money in Stocks. I think that's William O'Neill. The Peter Lynch books are really good. One, One Up, up on, on Wall Street. Street. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think O'Shaughnessy has uh, a couple good books. I actually think the, the Stock Market Wizards by Jack Schwager are good. You know, there's others that are a little bit more in the weeds. I found the Soros books useful, but I don't think an average investor would, you know, but I, I, I think the, the, the stock market wizards is an interesting one because it shows you so many different people that were successful. It kind of gives you in the mind of the trader. I think O'Neill and Shaughnessy both are good growth investors and Peter Lynch just has a ton of common sense. Those would be the ones. Uh, there's a there's a good, you know. It's funny. Is um, what's his name? Uh, value investor David Dreamin. I think his reasons for buying stocks, contrarian investment strategies. I think his core underlying philosophy of what makes stocks work is terrible, but the analysis is really good. You know. <laughs> so so again, it's it it's like what they say in AA. Um, you know, take what you need and leave the rest. Uh, I think you kind of have to do that with investing, right? Is is anything you read, you don't have to to, to take everything that's there. You got to take the pieces that are useful for the strategy that you've chosen. But those are some off the top of my head. Can we talk about Live Nation as a stock and as a company that you like? Yeah, look. Uh, and, and is 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 COVID um, having an impact on them? I mean, what do you think? <laughs> yes. Yeah, look, I, I, I think, I mean, I mean, they went, they're doing zero revenue. You know, they went from doing, I mean, I'm pulling up my Bloomberg Last year, like to give you an example, last year in Q3, they did, oh my God, it's incredible. Last year in Q2, they did 3.16 billion of revenue. This year, they did 74 million. Okay. So I, uh, that's 2% of the revenue. So yes, it's had a big impact. What's its ticker code, Enrico? Ticker LYV. Mm -hmm. L is in live, Y is in young, V is in violent. And of course, this is not um, a recommendation to buy, but we're just discussing this as an example. Yeah, exactly. Although I think it's a great company. If you have a long-term view, it's definitely worth taking a look at. You know, look, they built this incredible flywheel. They own the real estate. They have scale. Uh, they own the distribution. Um, what, do they, what do they do in Rico? Yeah, apologies. So Live Nation is actually the world's leading concert promoter. So they started out as a number of companies. They were just a promoter. So when ACDC goes on tour, they would go to ACDC and say, hey, mates, we're going to pay you 50 million bucks and we're going to schedule 100 stadium dates and go out and take care of that. And then their job was, you know, taking care of all that project management and making 250 million on the tour from tickets and merchandise. What they did go through time, though, is they bought all the pieces. So they own Ticketmaster and most of the major ticketing agencies throughout the world. They own many of the smaller arenas. So 1,000 to 5,000 cap places where you would see a band. They actually own the venue. And then what they do is they go out and create these exclusive contracts and all this. But what happens is they own a merchandise company. They own the ticketing company. They own the venue. So if you think about a dollar spent... So I'm a fan. I go to see ACDC. I'm going to spend uh, $160 on the ticket, and I'm going to spend $85 on merchandise, and I'm going to spend $40 on pints of beer at the show, okay? So whatever, that's, that's, that's $250. They probably at this point are involved directly in the value chain to them in $150 to $200 of that, okay? Because... If they own the venue, well, then they get all the all the concessions and then they have a merchandise deal, et cetera. And they basically weaved all these together. And, you know, live events has been a great it's so funny with COVID live events was such a great growth business because in a world where everything went digital, it was something you couldn't take digital. Right. And then it just went away because of COVID. 
what I think is actually going to happen post COVID is live events are going to come roaring back better than ever. But what's happened, and it's a little unfortunate, all of the independent promoters, they're out of business. They didn't have a balance sheet. They didn't have John Malone sitting behind them and the ability to go out and raise debt. So Live Nation's market share, which was already 35%, I think on the uh, I think live events go are come back bigger and better than ever before. 2021, the back half is going to be a massive year as we play catch up, and I think their market share goes from 30 percent to 50 because everyone else went bankrupt. Yeah, because I was interested um, reading about your views on it is that they built up the business by basically taking over what were mom and pop businesses in in each market these promoters were just very small and uh, very fragmented and they've basically bundled them all together. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, what I'm doing with my, with my digital company is exactly the same. We're going out and buying digital publishers in music primarily, or, or these passion areas. We then have an e-commerce platform. And what we're doing is I'm buying, I've I've got a a deal that I'm working to buy something right now, but when I get off this call, I'm going to write the guy an email you know, where he's got a great little company, he does 3 million users, he's got a little ad business, he just got his ass handed to him through no fault of his own, but we literally can buy his business and by the third or fourth month of owning his business, I will be doing in a month of revenue what he was doing in a year. Again, because I have scale, a platform, et cetera. So, you know, if you own one venue, a thousand cap venue in Canberra, you know, I'm just picking an Australian place. I've never been. <laughs> um, you know, you, you don't have the ability to do, you know, digital marketing and integrate merchandise, et cetera. So what they were able to do is is put all those companies together and then put them on a single platform and, and drive a, a tremendous amount of synergy. So we actually are building a little mini live nation in the digital media space, uh, digital media and, and music merchandise. You know, I, I don't know that we're going to be quite as successful as they were, but if I'm one one hundred successful, I will be very, very happy. So um, your newsletter, how can uh, people sign on to your newsletter and find out more about you? Apparently, it's a good newsletter. I mean, I, look, I, I, let me say something. I take this very seriously. You know, I had, before I joined my partner, Whitney Tilson, to do this, I mean, I had an offer to go run the short book at a $30 billion hedge fund, literally seven figures guaranteed. Like, you know, I'm not making that much doing this. I did it because I love the markets. I actually love educating. You know, it, it was funny when I was managing money. I mean, so we go and make money for, you know, CalPERS, the California State Pension Fund, you know, New York Common. I I, I was one of the largest minority owned firms because I'm uh, Hispanic and that felt great. But I get investor feedback on my newsletters and people are like, wow, you really explained something to me. I mean, we're, we're actually touching people's lives and I can see it. So I take this as serious as a effing heart attack, man. So we put a lot into this. You know, you can check us out at www.empirefinancialresearch.com. We do primarily focus on US stocks, although eventually we will probably look at some more markets. I actually, 50% of my investing was international. You know, I've got one newsletter, which is the most, which is the least expensive called Empire Elite Trader, which is a really good one. It's for trading, but that's the one where every week I sort of put my education views in, you know, and, and where I'm really trying to help people. But yeah, we're, we're super proud of it. And dude, our track record's been through the friggin' roof. I, I, you know, I would hope so after 25 years of doing this and spending my entire life on it, getting back to my dentistry example, you know, I would hope I figure it out after, uh, you know, all this time. We're launching a crowdfunding next week where actually individual investors can invest. Not, it's not Kickstarter. We're not asking for donations. You can buy a stake in the company and that's going to launch next week. And it doesn't matter. You can be in the U S you can be wherever you can a hundred dollars. You can buy a stake in project M. Um, and we're doing that very seriously. That's, a, that's something we're going to continue to foster, uh, you know, in the coming years. Enrique, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you. Absolutely. I appreciate it and uh, look forward to getting down under some point in whenever. <laughs> <laughs> Stocks for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not Stocks for Beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. And thanks to Christopher Sulos for music production out of Garlic Breath Studio. Music flows when the money don't. 